welcome to Friday night lecture series. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay, great. Tonight we have a very special treat. The dynamic geology, his, geologic history of Norway. Dr. Scott Burns, Professor Emeritus of Geology, past chair of geology at Portland State, is a native Oregonian and he is passionate about his Nordic heritage. He specializes in environmental and engineering geology, things like geomorphology and soils. And that gives him knowledge that informs thinking about things like landslides or slope stability or earthquake hazards or where to grow wine grapes. He studied and toured the geology of the Nordic countries. Tonight, he's giving us a tour of the challenges that geology presents for building roads, landslides, and takes us to a special place, Spitsbergen. Professor Burns. Well, it's great to be here tonight, and in, in fact, actually face-to-face -face and see people after a year and a half of Zooming everything. And, and so thank you very much for coming out on a Friday night to, to learn a little bit about the uh, uh, Norway. And there are a whole bunch of people also watching online, so to the, those of you online, a special hi to Sandra Miller, who can, it broke her shoulder, so she cannot drive, so she can't come tonight. She's normally at all these things. Uh, enjoy it tonight, too. And so I get to talk about Norway. And so I've been involved with Scandinavian Heritage Foundation now in Nordic Northwest for over 30 years. And so I'm, I'm even though with the name Scott Burns, I'm half um, uh, Nordic. And so my grandfather came from Denmark and my, uh, his wife, her parents came from Norway. So I'm a quarter Norwegian, a quarter Dane, and then the rest Scottish and English and Irish. And, and so, uh, I had a chance in my early teaching career. I taught in Switzerland from 1970 to 75, a young professor at the college level. And uh, every year at Christmas time, I would never come back to the United States because uh, it was just such a big trip. So I went to my Aunt Agnita's house uh, in Copenhagen and every year danced around the Christmas tree and got introduced to all of the, the Scandinavian uh, uh, traditions that are found at Christmas time. In the summertime, I'd go to the family farm up in northern Denmark and then travel all over the Scandinavian countries. And so I've traveled from one end of Denmark, uh, of uh, Norway, to the other end of Norway. And then I'm going to take you to Svalbard, uh, Spitsbergen, too, tonight, because if you go, if you haven't been there, uh, I encourage you to go. How many of you have been to Norway? Wow, I love it. We just got a lot of Norwegians or Norwegi Norway lovers. Well, hopefully this will bring back a lot of neat, neat photos uh, for you tonight. And then at the end, what we'll have is time to uh, um, answer, answer questions. And, and so let's take off and talk a little bit about the country. So uh, it, just reminding you, uh, uh, all of the, uh, the countries that we have in the Nordic countries, we have Norway, which goes all the way up from the North Cape all the way down to the southern part here. We got Sweden, we got Finland, we have the Baltic countries here, we got Denmark down here, and then way up here we got Svalbard, and then we have Iceland over here. And so, uh, but we're going to be talking about this. My great-grandfather was from Tromso up here. And then my great-grandmother was from down in Lillehammer, down south. So here, again, is just a picture of Norway. And there is Svalbard. It is the closest landmass that is found uh, next to the North Pole. And it is governed by Norway. And so I'm going to take you there. How many of you have been to Svalbard? It's, uh, one. All right. Now it gives you some place else to go to because it is an unbelievably neat place. All right. So a little bit about Norway. Um, and uh, compared to Oregon, it's got a little more, um, even though it's a long, skinny country, it's got uh, over 125,000 square miles. Uh, and then, it, it was, you know, over 1,000 miles long and up to 250 miles wide. The interesting thing is, got, look at all the 2,000 miles of coastline. I mean, that is an awful lot of coastline that you have got. And 80% of the country is mountainous. 
So there really is not a lot of flat land that you have got in the, in the country. And that's mainly down in Oslo and that southern plateau that is down in the southern parts which you got there. Compared to Oregon, you hear we, the latest census tells us we have about 4.27 uh, million people here. In Norway, you know, 5.5 uh, million people. So they got a few more than we have. But if you divide it by the, the, uh, the acres that you have got there, it's the most sparsely populated country in Europe at only 33 people per square mile. So uh, most of them are really concentrated in the, the big cities. And uh, Oslo is the big one, over 600,000, almost 700,000 people that are there. Bergen is the second largest, and then Trondheim. So those are the three biggie cities that you've got. Interesting, they only have four universities. And here in Oregon, we have more than that, even with less people that we have got. And just taking you around to some of the places that many of you have been to, Oslo, I love Oslo. It is uh, just a very, very special place. But my favorite place in Oslo is the Vigeland Park. Uh, and all these incredible statues that are out there. And I just it, it love, uh, you can just feel the feelings of all of these people uh, that are involved in that, and uh, just an absolute place. And if you haven't been there, you put that on the your bucket list to, to go to in the in the future. Bergen, I love. Look at all the beautiful colors of the houses along the waterfront that are there. Uh, and and then you, you go to Trondheim, also the same thing. So those are the three big cities that are. But I'm a geologist. I like the countryside. I like to get into the mountains, and that's where I'm going to be taking you tonight. Uh, and then Tromso, I have to put where my great grandfather is from, way up north, cute little town here, but just some very, very big mountains in the background. Everywhere you go in the world, uh, there is a story. Mother Nature is shouting out to you. There is an incredible story of where that land came from and what is the history of it, and then where is it going? I'm an engineering geologist. And so I predict where the landslides and the floods and the earthquakes and, and the volcanoes and tsunamis are going to be. In fact, I was actually on TV today talking about the house sliding down the hill in Upper Burnside because of all the rain that we have had. And I could have predicted that because every year, this time of the year when it starts raining, either Upper Burnside or Skyline or uh, Cornell are going to have landslides on it. So here's, here is Tromso, Gateway to the Arctic. Every year on the longest day of the year, they have a golf tournament that tees off at midnight. I would, because it's in the hand of midnight sun, I would love to play in that someday. And that's one of my bucket list things to do. And then here it is in, in the wintertime. So an absolutely beautiful place there. So that's taking you around it. And have any of you been to the North Cape? Is it, oh, I love it. Look at this. It's way, way, way up at the northern part of the country. Uh, and absolutely beautiful fjords that are coming in here. There's a, I think I have another picture also from the North Cape area that is here. I, as a geologist, I'm always looking at the rocks. The rocks here are ancient, way over uh, uh, a billion years old. They're what we call Precambrian rocks. And that, we'll come back to that uh, coming up in just a second. And in fact, right now, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the rocks that you have, have got here. So here's Norway, there's Sweden and Finland. Uh, and, but if you notice, all the colors are mostly greens and reds and, and purples. Those are telling us old, old rocks. And, and if they're old, old, they're going to be metamorphosed. And they're going to be high-grade metamorphic rocks like nice, G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, and schist. Uh, and then there's a lot of granite that is found there, too. And so those are the primary rocks that you have got here. Now, how did uh, Norway get, in fact, the Scandinavian countries uh, come together? Well, wherever you are on the face of the Earth, the Earth is moving. Right now, we are moving uh, in a westerly direction two centimeters a year, uh, which is, is about half as fast as your fingernails grow. Uh, so it's not very fast. You can't feel it. Uh, and the reason is, all over the face of the earth, you have magma that is coming up from deep down in the earth, and it comes to the surface, and there, it forms a big crack, and then it solidifies. And then more magma comes up, pushes uh, the, the plates, as we call them, to the side, and then the plates are moving away from the magma that is coming up. And then when they run into another plate, then they get subducted down underneath that, and they cause big earthquakes, just like us. We live on Cascadia. We have a plate off of the coast. And, and being destroyed underneath us as we go here. So the surface is always moving. 
And, and so here, here we are in North America. We are being created by the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and we are moving in that direction here. And then Europe is all moving in that direction. And, and South America is moving away from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Africa is moving in that direction. Then you have another ridge system down here, in the Pacific Plate's moving like that. Everything's moving. And if we go back in time, all of the continents were together. There was a supercontinent called Pangaea. That was at the beginning of the Paleozoic, uh, or no, the end of the Paleozoic, which is about 280 million years ago. All the continents came together because they were moving, and they went bang, 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 and then they formed an absolutely huge continent. And then after that, then they started breaking up and moving in different places. Uh, and, and so this is, this is all of the continents coming together, forming this big supercontinent called Pangaea. And then eventually it broke up. This part became Laurasia. This part became Gondwana land. Uh, and then it started breaking up. And then North and South America, or South America and Africa started breaking up. Antarctica, Australia broke off, et cetera. Uh, but when everything came together, when everything came together, it formed a huge chain of mountains, uh, starting down uh, uh, what we call the Washita orogeny. That's Arkansas, the Washita Mountains. And then uh, you go right up through the, it, uh, we call it the Allegheny orogeny, the Appalachians, and it, uh, because all the continents came together. And then you have the Hercynian orogeny. Those are all the mountains that go all the way up through Ireland and Scotland, and then Norway, Finland, uh, and, and Sweden. Uh, and so all of those mountain ranges that you have were formed as all the continents came together in the past. And so here is a map of the world today. That was called Baltica. In fact, we go back here, there is Baltica uh, up here. And, and so that was all one landmass, old, old rocks that you had at that time uh, and has remained intact since that time. So the evolution of, of Norway is interesting. Uh, the rocks, many of the rocks were formed two to three billion years ago. Uh, and some by volcanoes, some by sedimentation, but then it was put under heat and pressure with all those continents coming together. Uh, and, uh, and then they became gneisses and schists. And I'll show you those rocks in a second. And then that was done 400 million years ago. And they haven't, they haven't created any new rocks since that time, except one example we'll talk about down, down at the bottom. But the, um, and so the rocks of, of the Scandinavian countries, or at least Sweden and Norway, are old, 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 formed by the Caledonian orogeny when everything came together. And, and so uh, really, since that time, they have just been eroding away um, from 400 million years ago until 2 million year, uh, years ago. They just were eroding. Nothing was happening to any place in that particular area. Then, starting 2.6, 2.8 million years ago, then we started having the glaciers. The, the, the whole Earth's surface just went into an incredible cooling. Why did it do that? Antarctica got stuck at the South Pole, and you have uh, snow there and ice the whole time. It reflects a lot of heat that comes in. That's called albedo. And it creates a cooling. And then the Isthmus of Panama uh, formed, uh, connecting North and South America, cutting off a major current between the Pacific and the Atlantic, and also sh it shut off a whole bunch of warm currents going up into the Northern Hemisphere. And, and so we, and then, and then since that time, geologists have shown us the, the climate has gone cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, warm. And right now we are really getting warm. Uh, and that's why we have COP26 happening in Scotland right now. Uh, but about 50 million years ago, off of the Norwegian coast, a lot of the sediment that was eroding away uh, on the mainland came into the ocean and formed sedimentary rocks, sandstones and shales. Uh, and, and, and so that was very important because that's where all the oil and gas is. And it is a major oil and gas producer uh, today. But most of the rocks are very, very old rocks that you have got there. And so here is a beautiful example of a nice rock because it is nice, G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, high grade metamorphic rock. Uh, I have a, a t-shirt that I wear, wear in the Fred Myers all the time. It says, have a nice day, spelled G-N-E-S-S. -S. And, the, and the checkers will always say, have a Ganese day. No, it's nice, high grade metamorphic rock. I never miss a chance for some educational learning to occur there. And so you see a lot of this all around the country. 
And then here's more nice, gorgeous, gorgeous rocks uh, that you've got there. And then uh, here are my, a couple of my kids, and then we have a lot of tombstones. And the best, most expensive tombstones are all nices. In fact, this, this is organ nice because they have big, huge eyes of, uh, that are found there. And then lots and lots of granite. And, uh, uh, and you can imagine the T-shirts that geologists have here. Don't take, I, I'm a geologist, I don't take anything for granted. All right, so as you go up and down the coastline, you look here, nice, nice granite, granite, granite. I mean, so old rocks, I think you got that. So let's go on to something different. Uh, the climate that is here, it is incredibly mild in, in the big picture, mainly because you have the Gulf Stream that comes up the eastern side of the United States and then south of Greenland, south of Iceland, and comes over to the, the, uh, the Nordic countries. Uh, and in Tromso, way up north, uh, uh, has milder winters than you get in New England. And that's all because of that, uh, of the current that you've got there. Oslo's precipitation, uh, only 27 inches a year. We here in Portland get 37 inches a year. And so uh, it, it's an interesting uh, country from that standpoint there. So what are, what are the major physical features when you talk about Norway? Mountains, mountains, and mountains. And the highest mountains are the Jotunheim Mountains that you've got there. The highest two were only just, uh, just around 8,000 feet in elevation. I mean, Mount Hood's 11,000, so not as high as our mountains. But be, remember, they're old. These mountains have, were formed 400 million years ago when all the continents came together, and they've been eroding down since that time. Probably they were 20,000 feet high back in those days. And then fjords. I mean, uh, as you will see in the end, I rate all the fjords of the world, and I think the most beautiful fjords in the world are... In, uh, in Norway. Sonja Fjord uh, is the longest one, 114 miles long. Just go uh, from one end to the other end, and there are lots and lots of them. And then there are so many islands all over, 150,000 islands uh, that are there. My favorite are the Lofoten Islands, and they're, they're way up north, up near Tromso, and they're just you know, all these little uh, colored, different colored houses all over them, really, really neat. And then, as I mentioned before, North Cape, I showed you some pictures there uh, of that particular area there. Also, a lot of glaciers, and, and if you count all of them, there are like 1,500 glaciers there, but they're all doing one thing. They're shrinking. Why? Because the Earth's climate is warming. The best monitoring things geologically that show us what the climate is doing is to look at the glaciers. If the front of the glacier is moving down from year to year to year, then it's growing and the climate is generally getting cooler. But if it is warming up, the snout is retreating every year and that's what is happening there. Now, there are, there are rivers that are found in, in the country, but they're all short. I mean, the longest river is only 380 miles long, which is not, not very long at all. Uh, and then they have huge numbers of lakes. Look at the number of lakes, 160,000 lakes. And that's because the glaciers came down and carved out lots of basins and then they, they, they have filled in with water. So lots of them, uh, just like the land of 10,000 lakes, you know, Minnesota, same thing as a result of glacial terrain. And then Finland, exactly the same thing. And then you have so many beautiful waterfalls. Why? Because you got so many fjords. And you got the, a lot of these streams and rivers going over the edge in that particular area. So let's take you around and show you a few of these places uh, that we have got. Uh, now this is down south uh, towards Oslo. That's the plateau area, the low-lying area. And they're absolutely beautiful areas, especially along all of the bays that you have got there. But then we get up into the mountains and there are glacial landforms and these moving masses of ice that over the years have been eroding as they go down and turning V-shaped valleys into beautiful U-shaped valleys. And anytime you see a U-shaped valley, always think, oh, that was glaciated in the past. Well, I just, here's a picture of me in my early days. I was a glacial guy. Um, this was in 1973 as a young professor from Switzerland being sent to Alaska to learn all about glaciers um, that were there. And so here is, a, here is a typical glacier, moving mass of ice coming down into the sea here, and then it is eroding this valley and turning it into a big U-shaped valley. And then, uh, then the other glacier over here is eroding it away and creating a knife edge area, and that's what we call an arete. 
Uh, and, and so you have a bigger rent here and another rent here. And then if you go all the way up to the end, if you have two or three rents coming together, it forms a peak mountain. We call it a horn. And then, and then the area that is carved out is called a cirque. So cirques, or rents and horns and U-shaped valleys, those are indicative of a glaciated environment that you have in the past. And starting 2.8 million years ago and, and ending just about uh, 15,000 years ago, we had a lot of continental glaciers. In North America, they, they, they started, the glaciers started growing and moving to the very, very south, coming down as far as Kansas and Nebraska and Illinois out here, and northern uh, Washington and Montana up here in North America. In Europe, all the Scandinavian countries were completely engulfed by glaciers, valley glaciers, but then also just going over the tops of many of the mountains uh, that you have got there, and, uh, and also the all of the um, of Scotland, the United Kingdom, and then also Iceland. It is up here, and then in the Alps that you got there, and so they have ca carved many things. Now, on a glacier, uh, there will the upper part of the glacier. Uh, 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 there will always be snow all the way through until the next season, and and so when you go traveling on a glacier, the upper part it'll be snowing. This is a picture that I took uh, in the mid part of summertime. Uh, and so it's still lots of snow that is there. Now, the, uh, when you put a lot of, of mass on the crust of the earth, right, as glaciers, you're taking that water out of the ocean, and then you're, it's, it's being deposited on land as snow that converts into ice. What's going to happen? It's going to push down on the, uh, uh, on the crust of the earth, and, it, and it, it's going to be uh, decreasing. And then when that melts, what's going to happen? The, that land is going to rebound, and that's what we call isostatic rebound. And that's what's happening in uh, all over North America. And, and so if you go out to, for instance, the, uh, up in, in Canada, uh, and it, you can see the, these are in centimeters, uh, or no, feet, uh, sorry. Yeah, no, these are centimeters. Uh, the uplift of the, the ground that you have got in those particular areas, there are uh, uh, Hudson's Bay training posts that were used to be on the water here. Now they are like two or 300 miles inland because the whole thing is rising up. And in Scandinavia, the same thing is happening here. Uh, and uh, these are actually meters, not centimeters. Uh, and so the whole land is, is rising up because it had glaciers on the top of them, and then glaciers are gone, so everything is, is rising back up. And there are places up here in, in, in middle Finland and middle Sweden right here that have been raised up 100 meters, 300 feet, out of the, the water. And they are continuously rising up today. Uh, as you get further south, it's not quite as much. And, and so this is a result of the glacier that is still going on today. And, and with all of our magic little GPS devices, we can measure that in millimeters uh, of uplift every year. Now, all of those U-shaped valleys where the glaciers were coming down uh, out of the upper, uh, higher elevation areas, they were carving uh, those nice V-shaped valleys into nice U-shaped valleys. And then when sea level rose, and so after you melt all those glaciers, put all that water back into the oceans, what happened is sea level rose of 500 feet or 300 feet elevation. So during the glacial period, sea level around the world went down 300 feet elevation and then 5,000 years ago, it rose back up to where it is today. Uh, and so all of those U-shaped valleys in, in Norway got filled in with seawater. And a U-shaped valley filled with seawater is called a fjord. And sometimes it's with an FJ and sometimes FI, depending upon if you go with the Swedish or the Norwegian or Danish spelling that you have got. And, and so here, is, this is up in the Ostadalbrin area. There's your glacier that is still there, and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Beautiful U-shaped valley. Look at these glaciers in the past have come and completely uh, smoothed down all of the rocks uh, uh, over a long period of time. Why are they doing that? The reason is they pick up the rock fragments, hard rock fragments in the bottom of the glacier as the glacier is going along, they are grinding. It's called abrasion that uh, is causing uh, all of that to occur. Uh, <coughs> another one of the glaciers that we have got coming off of the Yastadalbring area. Now look at the color of the, of the water down here. Turquoise color. 
You can, it, it, anytime you're in the mountains and you see turquoise colors, it is, Mother Nature is shouting out to you that there is a glacier up there because there is a lot of silt-sized particles. The, 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 those rocks at the bottom of the glacier going over and grinding up the rocks, uh, the bedrock and the rocks and the glaciers to silt-sized particles. That silt gets into the water. It bends the light to the bluish-greenish end of the spectrum uh, and creating that color. And then as you go further down the stream, it gets less and less turquoise in color, but right in front of it, it's going to be murky in that color. And that is shouting out to you that that is a glacier-fed uh, uh, stream area. And this is one of my favorite places in all of Norway. Uh, this is Trollstigen. It's the Trolls Road. And so look at that big, beautiful, this is a perfect U-shaped valley. And then you have the highways coming in here, and then you go up and back and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. That's why they call it the Trollstigen or the Trolls Road uh, coming up here. I think I have another. Yeah, here's a, showing you the big picture of that U-shaped valley and the Trolls Road coming up. And, and many of the tourists that get a chance to go there, and I'm sure that many of you have been up to the place where this picture was taken, uh, looking down on the valley because it is so, so famous in the country. But that is, for my students, I love to show the beautiful U-shaped valley uh, that you've got here. Look at these fjords. You're going to see a whole bunch of fjords coming up because I love fjords. Uh, and this particular one, this is beautiful, solid granite. They don't have to worry about that thing uh, falling off there. Uh, all these people out here taking the photos uh, down on the, the fjord below. So look at all of these. Just think, going back uh, two million years ago, the height of the, the glacial periods, and this whole valley just being completely filled with ice. And so there's a cirque, there's a cirque. There, this is a huge arete here. This is part of another arete. That is actually a horn, and that is a horn that is there too. Uh, and so wherever you're going in the country, you're going to see cirques, arets, and horns, and fjords, and U-shaped valleys. Mother Nature is shouting out the glaciers were incredible in the past and really lots of fun to go to. And if you get a chance to go to Norway, be sure to get on a boat for some of the time and go up and down some of these fjords because they are absolutely Beautiful, awe-inspiring uh, out there, and especially with a little uh, glass of Norwegian beer or Danish beer or a little aqua vif, a little schnapps, you know, it makes it even better. Uh, so lots and lots of fjord pictures that we have got there, and that, to me, is so indicative of, of Norway and the mountains that you have got. Here's the Hardinger uh, fjord, and actually there are a couple of different segments of that. Lots and lots of boats here. I think I have five or six um, more ones. Sonia Fjord, this is the largest one. Got the Norwegian flag in here. Uh, and then Granger Fjord, and look at this gorgeous one. Taking hikes up to the very, very top and overlooking it. It's just absolutely beautiful. I love this. I think this next one. No, no. let's go back. Yes, uh, just gorgeous, gorgeous ones. And then we got one here, another one looking. Look at these hay barns and these little tiny farms that are here. Uh, we'll come back to farming in just a second. Ah, here it is, the queen of the fjord, uh, hanging up uh, up on top on that overhang down here. Look at the very, very small little uh, villages down at the bottom. I'm going to come back to this because what would happen if the whole side of this mountain fell down into this uh, fjord? you're gonna produce a tsunami. Uh, and what's gonna to happen to little villages like this? They're toast. And it has happened in the past, and so the, the Norwegian government is very proactive on that. And that's an area of my specialty, or landslides and rock falls, predicting where they're gonna be happening. And we're gonna come back to that in a second. And so another fjord here, I can't pronounce the name of this, but uh, it is, I got a couple pictures of that. But it's absolutely beautiful, so you can see. This country is just one fjord after another, after another, and absolutely beautiful uh, that, uh, that are out there. And Stegestein uh, uh, fjord that you got here, Stein is just another word for rock. Uh, and Arlen's uh, fjord, much smaller one that you've got there. And then look at this place here. How would you like to be out there on the edge looking down? Pure granite, just like if you were in Yosemite um, and uh, hold the edge of that. So here's my rating of fjords in the world. I've had a chance to go to all these different places. Norway has them all built, beat. Now, British Columbia, and maybe some of you have taken the inside passage 
uh, going up from uh, Seattle all the way up into Alaska. Beautiful fjords that you've got up there. New Zealand, I used to live in New Zealand. Oh, the Southern Ireland has some great, great fjords that are down there. Iceland also, beautiful, beautiful fjords that you've got there too. E the East fjords, the West fjords. I like the West fjords best, but the other, and then Chile. Uh, it's also got some beautiful fjords. So there are other places, but the best in the world, Norway, has them all beat. Now let's get up into the mountains and the Jotunheimen Mountains that we have got there. Uh, and a lot of granite and, and a lot of uh, nice that we have up in those particular uh, areas and a lot of glaciers uh, that are up in that area there. Uh, but now let's go back down to the coast. And it has some of the most unique coastlines. Now, many of you have been up and down the Oregon coast, which is absolutely beautiful. A lot of people come from all over the United States to see it. Uh, and we have go in and out of the forests and the headlands and then back inland, and we have uh, sand dunes a lot. But uh, it's very, very stark, highly glaciated along the Norway area. Very few trees because you're so far north. Uh, and, and it's just abs it's a different type of beauty that you get as you travel uh, along here. Here's the Alnus Coast that you've got. And uh, uh, look at all the white rocks, granite, uh, all well-rounded granite boulders that you've got. Allison, uh, and they, they build the water right down to the edges of the fjords of these particular places here that are be be coming out. So uh, beautiful coastline uh, from one end uh, to the other. The uh, Helgeland uh, coastline, uh, look, look at these glaciated areas. Cirque, 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 cirque. These are ret, ret, ret. The glaciers are all gone now. And then anytime you have a lot of glaciers and you have the melting of the glaciers, you're going to have a lot of waterfalls, just like in Iceland. You got a lot of them. Those are fosses. So the, this is the Latifossen, one of the famous uh, waterfalls that you have got uh, in uh, Norway. So let's shift over to people a little bit. And, and how do the people live and what do they do? What are the major industries? Well, fishing, lots and lots of fishing, lots of cod, lots of herring. Oh, I love pickled herring. It is just, oh, maybe some of you guys do uh, too. Uh, sailing, because uh, they, how do you get up and down the coastline to all these different islands? It's mainly by shipping. Uh, and so they have an incredible merchant fleet that is out there. Now, with the finding of oil and gas, I'm going to come back to that in 1966 off of the coast. There, there's a huge industry uh, in that, that part of it. And then also they have a lot of trees. And, and so the forestry industry, the pulp and paper industry is also there. Uh, farming, only 7% uh, uh, of the, the people who have jobs in the country are farmers. So it's a very, very low percentage that you've got. And only 3% of the land is actually good for farming. Why? Because it's so steep. It's mountainous. And, and a lot of them, high mountains, you can't grow anything. any. And, and so most of that farmland is grazing land. So you don't have a lot of wheat farming and corn and maize and things like that. Uh, also, they do a lot of shipbuilding, and the Norwegians and the Vikings have been building ships forever and ever, and so that is a big industry that you have got here. And then tunnel building, and I just, it, it, it's amazing when they want to put a road, they don't go around the edge of the mountain, they just go right through the mountain. And, and, and the road that goes between Oslo and Bergen, if you count all of the tunnels, 184 tunnels as you're going along. And oh, I forgot to get the picture in here. Um, they have a new tunnel that ships can go through because, uh, you know, these big, huge ocean liners that go up and down the fjords and you have a big fjord here and a big fjord here. And if you have to go all the way out into the ocean and then back in this way, it takes a lot of time. How about just go right through the mountain? And they did that and they made a tunnel. Uh, that they, they, you can blast right through there, and the, these big ships uh, came through, and that was a, one of the news items in the newsletter that I put out uh, like a year ago. I mean, a tunnel for ships, uh, ocean-going ones. Interesting, how do they get their power? 100% of the electrical power that you have in the country is hydroelectric power. Clean energy, uh, and, and so that is nice to have that, too. Uh, and, uh, and it's tops of the world for the amount of hydroelectric power per person. Of course, they don't have a lot of people. Number one, they got a lot of hydropower, so that's not too difficult to have. Now, they, they have more power than they actually need, and so what do they do? They can have uh, industries that need a lot of power, like aluminum. 
Uh, and, uh, and we used to have aluminum plants all up and down the uh, Columbia River. Now, zip. Why? Because the co cost of the electricity has gone up. But in this particular country and in Iceland, they have aluminum. They ship the bauxite in from the, uh, from the Caribbean, and then they melt it down there. But copper, nickel, lead. So all of these ores uh, that you've got, you melt them down. Also, uh, um, they also have a good fertilizer uh, for making fertilizer, nitrogen. Uh, and then, uh, now many of the ores that you have got that are listed right here, they're coming from the northern part of the country, up in the granite areas. Um, nice, nice, you don't find, uh, the metamorphic rocks, not a lot of, of the ores, but when you have granite, at the edges of the granite plutons, that's where you find a lot of the gold, copper, lead, zinc, and all of those things. Uh, and so uh, they have quite a bit there. How about transportation and getting around the country? Well, um, they only have four, uh, only a few of the four lane highways. Why? Because there first aren't a lot of people, number one, and they don't have a lot of flat land. And so many of the, many of the tunnels you need are just two lane roads and it works fine. Huge merchant fleet. So that's the major way of getting around the country, except down in the Oslo area where you have the highways that are down here. And then the tunnels everywhere. Interesting. Uh, uh Scandinavian air system, SAS. Uh, was one of the first airlines that actually started going to the United States over the poles. Uh, now, it's, it's standard of practice. When you fly from Portland to Germany or to Europe, what do you do? You go over the poles. It's much faster than going around the other way. But the, it was the Scandinavians that said, hey, it's a lot easier to get to North America going over the poles than going around the, the other side. Uh, bridges are everywhere. And, and I just, I, some of the bridges are just ingenious, uh, how they are made and, uh, I, I thought this one was uh, very, very interesting and decided to put that in there too. Now, I tried for about an hour and a half today to download my favorite geological site in um, the country, and it never worked. And, and so if you write down uh, Carrig Bolton Rock, it is a big crack in the rock at the top of a fjord. Uh, and, uh, and a big boulder has fallen into the crack. And people like to go out and sit on the top of this boulder with this huge crack below and then thousands of feet down to the, uh, to the, uh, fjord below. And it's in everybody's book and it's not in my slideshow here. I apologize for that. But if you write that down, go home and, and um, and look it up and it, it is very, very exciting. Oh, let's go back to the tunnel. I want to talk about this road system that they have got here. Now, uh, uh, some of the tunnels uh, are built there not to go through the mountain, but to uh, go in places where they have a lot of snow avalanches in the wintertime or landslides. Uh, and, and so the highway department, so I, I spent two weeks on a tour of the whole country learning about all of this uh, a few years ago. Uh, and, and so this was an area that always has a lot of rockfall and landslides coming down. So they said, okay, we'll just run a tunnel underneath it because they always come down in this area and therefore we can keep the road open all the time and not have to worry about cars getting hit there. But as you drive around the country along the coastline, if you look next to them, a lot of times there will be a big berm that is here. Why? Because rocks falling down the slopes from the very steep sides of the old fjords there are caught and they don't get onto the road and they, you're being protected. And here's another one of these ones from a high rockfall area that is there. Uh, and so this is how you live in an environment that has a lot of rockfall and a lot of steep slopes uh, that are there. Uh, and then they have mapped out where most of these landslides uh, or snow avalanches come from. And then they take care of the roads uh, that are down um, at, at, at the bottom. This particular one here, here's a major highway coming through here, always has huge numbers of debris flows coming through. And this is uh, types of landslides that are very, very wet. Yeah. And so what they have done is they have built walls here to keep it in here instead of spreading out in this direction here. And then when things start coming down, they stop the road uh, and, uh, and then wait until the whole thing has stopped in the end. Uh, and then you can see here, these are snow avalanche tracks right in here, coming right down in here. Uh, and, and so they, they funnel them off in, in this particular area and this particular area here. And here's another snow avalanche type of place here. And they have built this berm, which is now forested here. And the, they go off in the, in the sides. And here's another snow avalanche one uh, here. This one goes right down into the, the water. 
Here is a huge snow avalanche that came down and it went over the road and then they have just plowed it so at least cars could get through in one direction. So it's a big problem. Now back to that uh, thing that I mentioned before about the, um, the, the fjords. If you have a lot of rockfall coming down into the fjord, you may have a huge tsunami that is occurring and a lot of people may be killed. Uh, and so you don't know it as a tourist, but I know it as a scientist all over the country. They know when cracks are starting to open. So you can see, can you see the cracks that are, well, we've got a dotted line on here. Uh, that's a whole landslide. That whole thing is fixing to move and slide right down the, uh, uh, the side of the fjord into the area down here, and that will pr produce a huge wave. And, and so these are all monitored with lasers. Uh, and so you've got huge, uh, huge reflectors, and then lasers are on the other side of the, the fjord, and they bounce back, and then uh, if they start moving, uh, what will happen is they will start monitoring and looking at it. If it starts moving at a very, very fast rate, they will evacuate the people up and down the fjords. You, you have, you know, 15 minutes to get to uh, 50 feet above where you are. And so everybody on all the fjords, so here's one, here's another one, the Alcanus uh, one here, this area, this area here, these are also uh, uh, being monitored today. And then here's another one up off of these fjords uh, that you have got. And so the government is saying, we need to prevent people from be being killed. And they are out there, and now we have the technology to do that. And we have similar types of places here, Pacific Northwest too, where we have some rock falls that are just about ready to come down. Uh, and then here's another one. You can see the big cracks that are opening up in this particular area. And look at that big crack right there. That whole thing is just fixing to go down this uh, uh, slope. And so as a result, they have the reflect reflectors that are out in that particular area there. And then there are a couple of other ones. Look at these big cracks that are found here. This whole thing is ready to go right down uh, into the bottom there. So they there. And then this is what it looks like on the ground. It's obvious. I mean, that thing is starting to move. And then uh, they measure, uh, is it moving or not moving? I mentioned the petroleum early, earlier. earlier and for the Scandinavian countries and the, actually the Nordic countries, uh, they have to import all of the energy that you have got, except now they have hydroelectric power and wind energy. The Danes are leading the way in that particular area there. But um, they found these huge oil deposits back in 1966, oil and gas. Now, the interesting thing between the oil and gas deposits, which are still Norwegian waters, and the mainland, there's a big trench that is out there. And so it's hard to take a pipeline from the deposits onto the land. So actually, most of the oil and gas goes over to Scotland uh, and uh, the opposite direction. Then it comes back, but it's all owned by Norway that you've got. And they only use one sixth of it. Uh, and so they export uh, the rest of it. And what does that do with that huge amount of oil and gas being exported? Lowers taxes. You go to Sweden, you go to Denmark. My cousins, are, they're paying 65% income tax every year. Uh, and, but in Norway, it's about half that because of the oil and gas that you've got, so much lower taxes. And to end with, I just wanted to mention just a little bit about Svalbard, this island that is way up north, close to the, uh, the, to the north, and lots of polar bears up in that particular area there. And in fact, when you, the kids that go to school in the morning, uh, they all carry rifles just in case a polar bear may come along. Uh, and uh, I'll show you um, a little bit about that. Lots and lots of glaciers, lots of islands that are there. So Svalbard is the whole area. Spitsbergen is the main island where most of the people live on. Uh, and, and, and so I have lots of friends that go up and study the glaciers, and they're all retreating in that particular area up there. Now, the rock is different. It's all sedimentary type of rock. And it has huge coal seams going right through it. Uh, and, and so coal is one of the major uh, exports of this. And a guy, a, a New Yorker named John Longyear, actually found this way back 100 years ago. And he uh, came there and he started exporting coal from there. And then the Russians are still doing it. I'll show you. And this is Longyearbyen. This is the major place that you fly into. This is the major town that is there. Look at all these old U-shaped valleys that are out here. Look at all the beds, sed sedimentary rocks that are there. Uh, and then the school is right over here. And downtown is right here. It it's a neat area that is there. So there's downtown, Spitsbergen. And a um, neat, neat place to go to. In the uh, wintertime, northern lights. Lots of them. You're right there. They're coming right down on top of you. 
um, uh, that you got. And so I had a chance to visit there a few years ago. We stayed at a place called Base Camp, uh, and uh, it was it was exciting. Here is the, they have a college, university there, and a lot of students from all over the world go and, and spend at least a semester or two semesters there. Winter times a wee bit cold because it, it, the sun doesn't come up, but you still have to carry the rifles for the polar bears as you come into the college. Here is John Longmuir's uh, coal mine. There, it's all they're not not mining it anymore. But you go around the other side of the mountain. Uh, well, look at all the fossils that you have got here. But the other side of the mountain, uh, the Russians are still uh, mining over here. So I got a chance last time I was there to go around on the boat uh, and, and to the other side. Uh, and the, you can tell the, 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 uh, by the signs that it is all in Russian. And they're still mining. Look at all the coal that is coming out. And that's all going back uh, to uh, Russia. Uh, and here was our guide who took us around there. Uh, um, and, and then some more northern lights that you've got there. More northern lights, and you can see the lights of the, the village down below. Northern lights are absolutely gorgeous. And we actually had some just recently here in Portland we could see. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is landslides. They have the most unique landslides in the world. And a very famous one occurred in Rissa, and they always occur in the, uh, in the fjords. And it's the end of the fjords where the land is flat as a pancake. And it's all sediments that were deposited by the glaciers. And what happens is, uh, if you start, you start digging something and you dump a whole bunch of soil into the, the water at the end, it will cause a chain reaction. And then all of the land will continuously just keep falling in, falling in, falling into the, the whole, uh, river, uh, into the fjord. And all the farms, all the houses will just fall in and float down. And, and so this was captured in 1978 in the Trondheim uh, area. Uh, and uh, it made into a movie that we now show to all of our geology and engineering students around the world the most interesting type of, of landslides. What's happening is all of those sediments there uh, that were laid down in the bottom of the field had lots of salt in them. Then they've been uplifted because of isostatic rebound, and then water percolating down through them dissolves the salt and leaves lots of holes in the sediment. And if you have enough vibration that is there, what will happen is the whole thing will just start uh, liquefying the soil, and everything flows in. Uh, and in this particular one here, 1978, you had five to six million cubic meters. And it, you just watch one farm house after another barn after another go in. And that particular one, 40 people lost their farms and one person actually died. That's called a quick clay, clay landslide. Uh, the other place in the world this occurs, Quebec, same type of sediments that you have got. Uh, and this is what it looks like afterwards. And the, uh, down the, downstream, you can see all the farms that have just get, been floated down in and it, everything slides in. In the last two years, we have had, um, uh, this is in that same area of Rissa, we've had two of them. 2012, in, uh, Vincent, we had one, and then just uh, two years ago, uh, in uh, Yerdrum, uh, same thing, uh, about eight or nine houses slid down in. So that's the story of Norway. The incredible geology that we have there. Uh, and uh, incredible people that are here, the great, incredible culture, and I tried to hit on all of those different things. Old rocks all formed uh, as all the continents came together 400 million years ago. So that is a story, and with that, I would like to stay, talk, and show you, take you back to um, the, uh, the Trollheim. Thank you. I think we have time for questions. We have time for questions. Um, and Sonia will come around with our microphone. We have a question in the back, Sonia. And we use the microphone so the people at home can hear too. Uh, can you explain why um, Svalbard is sedimentary rock versus the gneiss and granites on, on the rest of Norway? A great question. And, and the reason is, it's, it is not part of the whole massif that is found in Scandinavia. Uh, and it was not affected. Uh, it was an outlier of an older continent uh, that was there before that was not part of Pangaea. 
Uh, and so the, the sedimentary rock that was there never went through metamorphism and it remained as those sandstone shales. And, and, and coal, what does coal tell you? It tells you that was a, a old swamp that formed close to the equator. And that has moved all the way up there to the North Pole. Uh, and it, it's, just, it's fascinating uh, what geology, all, the, all these revelations that have come through actually in the last 50 years. So, all right, another question from in here. Okay. <clears throat> Scott, was there an earthquake that struck Oslo 1,500 years ago? And what kind of damage was that? So if you don't know Greg, he's another professor at Portland State. We're both retired professors at Portland State, Greg Jacobs. He's very involved here. But the, um, uh, and I think there was. I don't know that much about the earthquake uh, 1,500 years ago in uh, Oslo. I'll have to look that up. But uh, maybe you know more about that than I do, because I, I, that's something that I have not read a lot about. But uh, the, anytime you ha have um, earthquakes, you've got a fault. And then what happens is, uh, there's movement along the fault, uh, the rock, and then all of a sudden it breaks and it goes back to its original position that it's there. And there are faults that are found in the country. Uh, and it could be a fault that was reactivated by this isostatic rebound and everything uplifting. Uh, and so it could be something along that. I would imagine it would not be a really super big uh, earthquake, but uh, do you know more about that? I mean, I don't. Okay, so it was a smaller earthquake. Yeah, now I read something that there's hardly any tectonic activity in Norway, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. All the Scandinavian countries, very little earthquake activity, mainly because there are no major faults uh, that are there. Uh, plates aren't moving by one another. It's just all uplifting. There's a, uh, Sonia, there's a right in back of you. It sounds like you're saying that Norway is not a subduction zone area. So what formed that trench that interfered with the pipeline back to Norway? You are good. That is a great question. And, and so, yes, uh, the, it is not a uh, uh, active subduction zone uh, that, that is there. Uh, and uh, because there is no plate that is coming underneath that. And I think that that actual trench that is out there is an erosional one. Uh, that relates back to uh, water coming off of the glaciers. And, and uh, 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 it's not a super deep trench like the Marianas Trench or something like that, but it is a depression. And I think it was more caused by water coming off of the, all of the melting of the glaciers before. But it, it is a trench. And so that's why they had the pipelines go the opposite direction. We've got a question way in the back. Yes, this is a question from online. Oh. Um, it asks... Um, can you talk more about the geology of eastern Norway? Is it similar to the west except for the mountains and the fjords? Uh, so that is a good question. East, as you get into eastern Norway and then it's into Sweden, uh, the rocks get younger. And so the maximum uh, metamorphism is all in the western part of Norway, the gneisses and the schists and the granites. Uh, granites are not uh, metamorphic rocks, but the intrusions. And as you go to the eastern side of Norway and into Sweden and over into Finland, then you get into younger rocks. Now, they're still very, very old rocks, and uh, but not quite as metamorphosed as you've got. But there is a difference, and I did show you... A, a picture earlier, I didn't want to bore you with all the names of all of these different formations that are there, but it, it is different once you get into Sweden. Great question. Another question. Any other questions? Oh, there you go, right over here. I read once that when the pyramids were being built in Egypt that the, the uh, glaciers were still receding in the Scandinavian countries, and I wonder if that's really true. Uh, that you've, you've read well, and that's very true. And um, uh, when the pyramids were being built, not only that was happening, uh, in, in Lebanon, they had uh, uh, the, the Phoenicians, were the, uh, they had huge cedar forests all over Lebanon. And how, what did they use that cedar for? To make boats. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and then all over North Africa, there was huge amounts of 
uh, forests and different type of climate. It was very wet in the Middle East at that time. And that was at the tail end of the glacial periods that you have got. Now, the, the climate has completely changed in the Middle, middle East. But it was much wetter at the past. And in fact, uh, people have looked at the weathering of the pyramids. And they're saying, whoa, it, it, it was much wetter in the past than it is today. And then the vegetation, the palynologists, the pollen people have told us that things were much wetter there. And the Phoenicians tell us, hey, we had cedars. We don't have them today. Another question right here. A couple of years ago, Lisa and I were on top of Prekestalin. And uh, um, you, you said that it's not going anywhere. I want you to elaborate on that because I remember stepping across a particular cra crack going, man, this thing could give way. Are the scientists measuring that because there's so many tourists up there or what? Yes, and, and, and so that was one of the sites that I showed you, the flat, flat surface uh, looking down on the fjords. Yes, they are measuring that because they have so many tourists that are coming out every year. Uh, and it is, it, it's, it's less than a millimeter a year that, the, that you've got in the distances that they, they have. And they would not allow anybody to go out there if it was moving faster than that. And, and actually, if I'm not mistaken, as you go down the cliff from there, uh, there is a big um, a reflector and the laser is beamed off on it periodically. And so they're monitoring it in that area too. So yes, they're, they're cognizant of that pact and they would not allow people out there if it was gonna be starting to move. Good question. Okay, one more question. There's a famous rock kind of a mountain called Torhatten up north off the coast, and it has a hole right through the middle of it. It's 250 feet or something like that. How did that hole get there? What's the elevation of that hole? Um, <laughs> it's way up there. Not, huh? Yeah, it's toward the two thirds of the way up, but I don't know how tall the, the rock is. You have stumped the professor. I have the foggiest idea. <laughs> is it spelled T-O-R? Like Tor Hotten, yes. Tor Hotten. No. Wow. Oh, it, there's a, there's a um, story that goes with it that I've read about. Well, and tell the story. Well, I can't remember the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> well, make it up. <laughs> we'll, we'll save it for, for the next time. For the next time, time I'll come prepared. <laughs> yes. I'll send you a picture of it. Well, I, I'm, I'm very intrigued about that. I yeah. will send it to you. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious well, how that hole got there. Good. Well, I just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Scott will be here to come up and ask more questions. And I really look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs>